Hi everyone, and welcome to the Illustration Department Podcast. I am your host, Giuseppe Castellano. In this podcast, I talk to folks in illustration, animation, and other creative fields about their beginnings, their successes, and the bumps and bruises they've experienced along the way. In this episode, I conclude my conversation with author and illustrator Kelly Light. Among other topics, Kelly and I talk about what it means to be a good character designer. We discuss the importance of believability in illustration. We both get real about social media. And we explain why publishing is one big gamble. Lastly, Kelly pinpoints the two things she thinks everyone needs to live a life as an illustrator. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Now, now this is going to be so much more dripping with irony now. Very often, I will refer, I will, I will send illustrators your way to your website and I will talk to them. It's about characters, about how do you draw a character? How do you convey emotion? And how do you, in a believable way, create gesture and have this character have, have volume, you know, and, and do it by the way, consistently over 32 or however many pages. So I tell them to go to your website and I tell them to look at your books because that's what you do that so well. And that, and character design is something that continually comes up with in conversations with illustrators. How does one do it? How does one successfully design their characters. They hear about it all the time at conferences or wherever. But what does it mean to you to be a good character designer? What do you have to remember? What do you have to accomplish in order to successfully design a character? Um, Okay. So one of my favorite things to do is to give a workshop on this. I love to give a character design workshop. You have to be able to act You have to be able to act. You have to be able to become your character and act with your pencil. And that is 100% from animation. Um, You know, whether it's you have a mirror hanging at your desk and you're making silly faces in the mirror so that you understand how a face stretches when it's happy and, you know, contracts when it's angry and expands when it's shocked. Like, there's, there's got to be... You have to be able to feel the feelings your character's feeling, and then you have to be able to draw your character feeling those feelings. Um, you know, I tell everybody when I give the workshop, like, if you have a character of a little kid and it's reaching to get a cookie out of a cookie jar, you surely better get up off your chair, out of your chair, and go and reach for a cookie out of the cookie jar. Like, you need to feel how the pose feels, and then go back to your paper and draw it understanding how it feels and you know it, it to me there is no other way than than to, to to act with your pencil and you then to get technical you then need to know if you design a character and that character is standing straight on a piece of paper and that's the only way you know how to draw your character you can't take your character through 32 pages of the picture book you have to understand that character. You have to break it down, and you have to create for yourself a little visual library of how that character looks in all different angles, in different ways, in different poses. And I do that, and I I draw hundreds more drawings than I need to draw to fill a picture book or a dummy. But, you know, before I do that, I will draw the character in hundreds of ways and I put them on the wall and then I have a visual reference right in front of me of how the character already looks. If I have to draw three quarter or if I have to look, if I have to draw the character over the over their shoulder and you're only seeing the side tiny tip of their nose and their hair is falling in front of their face. Well, I need to know what that looks like. So that's that's what it is to me. And it sounds like a lot of work. And I think if people get daunted by that then you have to ask yourself what do you want what are you doing <laughs> do you really want yep. this because it is a it lot is, of work it is a lot of work yeah going back to chuck jones he said when it when he talked about like you know I, I call it injecting character i don't know if that's, that has a odd visual but adding character to your characters adding personality to your characters 
he boiled it down into into three words that I'm, and and it's so simple and uh i i kick myself for not thinking of it this way but he he essentially he said you're basically accenting what's natural so one i'll give you two examples one example is when you think of wiley e. coyote he'll walk off the cliff and then you obviously realize you know what's going to happen next, but then his body falls, his head stays there, and his head looks at you and gives you that expression of, oh gosh, not this again. And right. the neck is stretched to obviously, you know, to sort of unnatural proportions, but he takes what's natural and accents it. And it's absolutely believable. You believe that that's going to, that's what's happening with that character. Right. The, do you remember the broomstick? bunny episode do you remember the witch yeah witch hazel I actually just drew her for a chuck jones tribute piece witch hazel yep she would turn the corner and she would do that like er, 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 kind of thing where she's trying yeah. to hit the brakes <laughs> and then and then go another direction and then she would be gone but there'd be a puff of smoke and there'd be bobby pins flying all over the place and yeah. that just that's a sort of a secondary action that follows that primary action. The primary action is whatever the character is doing, but then the secondary action, and this is where I'm going with this, the secondary action is just as important. And when I think about your work, I see the secondary action. I see that sort of bit of yeah. hair, you know, with Louise is going one direction, her hair is kind of going in the other direction. You're, you're, that is that layer of characterization that I find missing in a lot of portfolios. I, I thank you for noticing that, that I do do that intentionally. And I never connected it so much to the cartoons, but it is true. Um, yes, believability, right? So, so believability and the idea that if you want a kid to connect with that character and, and, and the greatest payment I've ever had for the Louise books is the fact that like kids ask me questions about, you know, what kind of cereal does she eat? What kind of pajamas does she wear? Like to, her, to, she's to her kids, real. she's real. And that is because of those little things, you know, the way Louise holds a pencil, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily the right way to hold a pencil, but kids don't always hold pencils right. Or, you know, all of those tiny little things, they, they add right. to that believability. 100%. Sure. I mean, and if your kid is of that, of, 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 of an age where they're losing their teeth, then they have a tooth. They have a gap in their smile or right. their bangs are uneven. And this is a right. very, for me, a very real thing. My, my daughters yeah. constantly cut their hair. Yeah. And, uh, yep. so, so, yeah. And you, I think you probably heard me say that Louise cuts her own bangs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, so it's a little skew. And those are, those right. are the details that, that give that character. And I think that's, that's why people right. reacted the way they reacted when they saw their, they, when they saw your postcard. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and that, you know, and I think for, for an artist, that moment is rare. You don't get that moment all the time. You know, not every book you make, you're gonna, you're gonna have that. But to know that I did that, and I achieved that, like, I'll always be like, all right, yeah, I did that. <laughs> you know, like, I get like, I actually, what I was setting out to do, actually, actually, happened and hit the note that I meant, you know, to hit. So they're cool. <laughs> well, that's the thing with you. I, I, uh, when I thought about this podcast, it was in January of 2018 and I was going through a very rough part of my life. And, uh, I was with my wife and we were, we were, we were sort of trying to relax and trying to think about positive things and and she suggested you know she's like you know a podcast sounds sounds right for the school it sounds interesting and have you given it any thought and i i think i thought of your name before i even answered that question and i was like yeah i think that's a good idea and your name was right there because when i th think about those around me you have for a while and now i even more so now that i know i i said to you back in 2010 you just have this ability 
with everything that you do, I think with, um, with Louise, of course, and with the rest, with your other work and just with who you are and what you say, there is a honesty and a vulnerability. And I don't, I mean, vulnerability meaning bravery because I, I, you just, there is no bravery without vulnerability. You, you, you can't be brave without, and, and, and be absolutely protected. You, you have to sort of be vulnerable and put yourself out there. And, and you do that. You do that on social media when others posture and perform and pander While that's going on, you share with us not just the highlights, not just the here's a here's the book signing and here's this lovely thing and here's this piece of art that I'm working on, but you also talk to us a little bit about your struggles. And I thank you for that. I think it means a lot, certainly to me, that uh, life throws us these curveballs and it sometimes is hard for us to, well, I'll speak for myself. It's hard for me to put my two feet on the floor in the morning sometimes still. Right. But then I remember you and I remember that yeah. you do what you do and you do it with this, uh, this strength that I, 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 I still, I still aspire to have. Here's where I'm going. Here's where I'm going with this. Yeah. Why? Why do right. I do it? Why do you okay. tweet about your struggles? Uh -huh. my, my issues, my struggles. Okay. Well, some of it is selfish in the fact that if you live in a pressure cooker f constantly and for too long, if you don't open that little tab and let out the steam, then what's going to happen? I'm going to be splattered all over the ceiling and I don't want to go there, <laughs> you know? So sometimes it is just that. Sometimes it's just like, I don't have anything and anybody around me right now. And I really need to scream and somebody better hear it. So sometimes it's that sometimes it's a selfish, um, letting off a little bit of steam. And sometimes it's not, sometimes it is done with some, um, intention and deliberately, uh, to let, to let people hear and see what's real in the cacophony of bullshit that exists on social media. Um, yeah, I get, and, and I will say that in the past, when I was trying to get published, I did work very hard, not only to get published, but I worked very hard to build a social media presence. But even then, when I had a blog, when blogs were the thing, even then when we all started on the Twitter and whatever, everything else, like I still wouldn't only talk about good things. And I was never purely into self-promotion. Um, I don't know. I think, I don't always think that I'm, I don't always think that I'm doing the best I could for myself, but I don't know if I can be any other way. I see other people who are so, so uh, slick and really um, pumping it out there constantly. I don't know when they get their work done because they're on social media so much. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell you're doing with that. Because, have, you know, I'm trying to find the time to make art. I, there's a, I've heard illustrators complain that about that very thing uh, when they talk to, about agents. They'll say something like, I sent my, I sent my submission to an agent and, uh, and then I'll, I won't get anything. I won't hear anything back. And then um, you'll hear them go, you'll hear agents say at the conferences, this is my, this illustrator I'm thinking of speaking. You hear an agent at the conferences saying how busy they are and that they're so sorry that they can't back, get back to you on your submission. Uh, that, but uh, they just have so many submissions that they can't get to everything. And this okay. illustrator said, but I see you tweeting literally every hour, three or four tweets yeah. an hour, every single day. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you get your work done? Uh, I don't know. Exactly. I, I, I think that about a lot of people, uh, but you know, everybody can work differently. Some people can split themselves. Some people can have, um, you know, they can have an open chat with other people while they're working and they feel like they're not alone because they're have this running chat with other illustrators or authors or whoever 
while they're working. And that's great that, you know, if that works for you, um, doesn't work for me. I can't do that. Um, but the, the promotional part of it, when somebody's, if you look at somebody's Facebook and somebody's Instagram and somebody's Twitter, and maybe it's somebody who you admire and you go there and every single thing that you see is, you know, oh, here's my book and here I am and here I'm standing here and here I'm with these other people and here, look, oh, blah, blah, blah. I, it makes me go, but well, where's the rest of you? Um, because I'm not just, I'm not just this person who exists in children's books. There's a whole human being here. And I tried for a brief amount of time to do that author page on Facebook where I'm like, no, people come to my page. Stop looking at my life. Please do not look behind the curtain. Things are not pretty there. And it didn't work. Everyone kept flocking and flocking and flocking to my personal page. So I threw my hands up and said, okay, you're going to see everything. It's going to be, you know. It's important to me. And I and I, I, I feel like I can safely say that it is important for illustrators who are sort of knocking on the door and those on the other side of the door as well to see that. Because a lot of times I'll be talking to an illustrator and, and social media envy uh, and sort of FOMO, I suppose. And there's, there's, there are right. elements of, of social media that, that poison their efforts. I agree. And I feel like we should really get real at this point. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like, Let's yes, I think the FOMO, the FOMO of the up and comers um, and the idea of what this career is versus what the reality, the idea of it versus the reality of it is, 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 it's very, they're very far apart. Is it a fun career to have? On so many levels, yes. I tell people, when it comes to children's books, it's a wonderful field because 95% of the people in it are amazing people, wonderful people, warm people, supportive people. But at least 5% that are total assholes. And there are assholes. And don't don't let it be the wet towel in your face like it was to me when I realized that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not everybody in children's books it has, you know, a halo and, and, and fairy wings and it's going to be your best friend. It's not. It's not going to happen. There is conference life and it is an altered reality. <laughs> it's not. Really? Oh, yeah. It's like a, I, I used to call it like it's a giant, it's a gigantic pajama party, and everyone takes its pause on their adult life and goes to a conference for a weekend and is with like-minded people and there's a lot of lovely art and storytelling happening. But yeah, it's it's not it's not. Uh, I also a lot of the time, and I, I, this isn't a fault, but it is a it is it does have a negative effect. The conferences, I mean, they're 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 all set up to help support you and, 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 and instill in you a sense of hope that it is, that this is something that you can do working in children's books, being an illustrator, being an author. So it's a lot of rah, rah, but it isn't a whole lot of reality. No. Do you, you know? No. And I, I have for the last, uh, what year is it? <laughs> for, for a little over the last two years, I've done this thing when I'm on faculty anywhere where I leave time and I say to people, you can ask me anything. And I mean anything. I said, you can ask me anything. You can ask me how much money I get paid. You can ask me what it's like. You can ask me, you know, anything because that's the stuff you really need. And I, and sometimes people sit there in stunned silence and I'll say, if you get $20,000 for a picture book and it takes two years till you see that picture book on a shelf, how are you going to make a living if you don't have some other way to make money? And they're like, oh, you know, like you need to know this. You cannot get one book deal and think you're made. No, you have to have several books being in the process at any one time and you're leapfrogging from one thing to another. That's the only way you can make a living doing this. And even then, you still have to supplement with all kinds of appearances, like what I'm doing here right now because I'm getting paid, you know, to do this. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of reality that's left out of a lot of what is shared. 
Right. I mean, do you say that actually? Do you say like, well, I'm here at this conference, I'm getting paid and this is what I, this is part of it. This is part of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't come to the conferences. I, I don't attend conferences really anymore as an attendee. I did it once because I thought it would be a, an inspirational kick in the butt. And I was like feeling like I needed it. And then I went there and I was like, now nah, I'd be better served if I had just gone somewhere with my art and been quiet somewhere and made art would have served me better than being at a conference. And, and that's not to say that conferences are not valuable. They are. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. You, I conference my way to publication. I was going to say, you got your first two books from attending an, an SCBWI mm -hmm. conf S -C -B -W -I yeah. conference. Yeah. Say that five times fast. Yeah. And, and they are. They're very, very, very valuable if you want to learn. If you want to learn, if you want to do children's books and you want to learn in a quick way and you don't have time or the money to go back to school to do it, then go join SCBWI. Absolutely. 100%. I mean, a good example of what you're saying, you know, reality versus or fantasy versus reality is you got when Louise, when you sent the postcard out, you received a number of book deals. And uh, one would think if on the other side of things, on the other side of the, of the door, you'd think, well, that's oh, that's it. Happily ever after. It's a book deal right. with a major publisher and big yeah. numbers. And you go on a tour, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. But that isn't it by a long shot, right? No. No, that was that was someone once told me you were shot out of a cannon and you didn't have time to put your hand, your helmet on. And so that has been like, like that's just absolutely true. <laughs> like yes, I was shot out of a cannon without a helmet on. And that meant that when I finally landed it hurt like hell. So um so yeah, yeah, it's that was only the beginning, right? I got a great beginning and then um, didn't realize. So the book was launched in September. I got sent on a very, very long, fabulous, but but like a fascinating odyssey of a book tour. It was 40 days. Wow. Um, which is very that's a, long. That's, yeah, that's biblical. Yeah. I, I arrived home. I left on my birthday, September 9th, and I got back like October like 14th or something and um, with only one stop home for one night and then back out on the road again. And uh, and it did what it was supposed to do. It did. I sold out my first print run before I got home. So how I told you it was a 50,000 print run, it sold out before I got home. And you said you were a lead. You I was a lead, lead. yeah. And I was the lead for HarperCollins. And just a side note for those listening going like, what the hell are they talking about? There are leads and there are makes. I don't know if all publishers act this way, but the major ones certainly do in some, in their own ways. There's a lead and a make. A lead is, this is, we, we anticipate this is going to be big. Right. And so since we think it's going to be big, let's give it some money. And let's send the author and the illustrator on tours and let's do X, Y, and Z. And then there's a make where you feel like it, this, this could be, this could be a lead, but it isn't quite there yet. It gets less money in the marketing for marketing and a little less attention from the publisher after the fact. That's about, that's about it. So I was, I was the, we're all in, we put all our chips, let's put all our chips on, on yeah. Kelly's, you know, shoulders. And, uh, and I'm sure the tour was and wonderful got, and flawless and, uh, you know, it was yeah. like you see in the movies. They really, they really liked my package. They, they liked my package. They really liked, they liked the whole package. They liked <laughs> that um, I was somebody who could be in public, right? I could speak in public and, and hold my own and um, my personality could support this book. Because what we didn't mention is after I finished the first Louise book, it got turned into a series. So my my deal was for one Louise book, but when I turned it in, HarperCollins was like, oh, no, lock her down. We want seven books. So that's where my 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 fortunate Louise po postcard got amped up to this whole other level. So the when they were launching me as the lead for fall 2014, they were launching a series. They weren't launching just one book. They were launching what they hoped would be a, a lucrative and ongoing series. And they were launching a career at the same time. And that's, that's the part like I will be, 
I will always be grateful to Harper Collins because I feel like no matter what, and you and I have both been through difficult times in our lives, and I'm, you know, when me, I'm not out of mine, I'm not out of the woods yet, Did but I. I feel like they gave me a foundation that I will be able to stand upon that foundation. It's not like I have to go back to square one. You know, I, I'm, I feel like I have a little bit more of a foundation to uh, move forward away from Louise into other projects. So, um, so that's, you know, that's the good, the good thing about, about being launched in that way is that, is that it, you know, I hope, and again, because we're being very real, <laughs> I hope that. I prefer to be artificial. I'm I prefer, not, I prefer plastic flowers rather than ones that yeah. go on the ground. <laughs> I hope that it's not like, like I always have this thing in the back of my head, how Chone's books are very similar to the entertainment industry, be it movies or music and that you you're only as good as your last, you know, like, oh, you know, the op- how did you open? What was your opening when, you know, weekend numbers? Or, you know, is it like your, like Alanis Morissette, Tagged Little Pill was so big, but that second album, nobody bought it, you know? So um, I always think about it that way. It's like, or does, or does a slump count that much against you? You know, it so it can. it can, I know it can. Yeah. It doesn't always, of course. And I think it certainly will not with you, of course. <laughs> Hopefully. No, it won't. Uh, your work is just too good. I've seen, though, over the, over my career where where sometimes we'll be in a sales meeting and, the, and someone will refer to a, another book that that person did with some other publisher. And they'll say right. something along the lines of, well, that book didn't do so well. And it right. plants this seed of doubt in the room. Right. And I always found that to be a little odd because A, that's a different publisher. B, it's a different book. It's a different format. I mean, C, there are different, so many different factors. The design of the thing is different. It's just a, an entirely different entity altogether. How can you take that and, and say it's a one-to-one comparison with what it is that you're doing with this person now? Right. And I think, yeah, when I, when I can think about this as, as a business, I understand it. You know, it took me a long time. Uh, I'll tell you. So after Louise came out that first award season that happened after the fall, there was a lot of pressure. Harper Collins wanted something. They wanted to see all of their, their, you know, their investment pay off somehow whether it be you get on all those lists at the end, whether or not you get a sticker, I mean, that's always like a big prize, but you want to get on all those end of the year lists. And um, I got on a few, but I didn't get on as many, I think, as anybody hoped. And it was a real hard time for me. I really, like I, like I felt the pressure um, then, and I felt like a failure, like I didn't give them, um, what they hoped to get, you know, for their, for their investment. And it took a while for me to parse the idea that, Oh, if I, if I didn't get tons of accolades that I wasn't going, cause the second Louise book was going to come out and it wasn't going to get the investment that the first Louise got. And if it had, like if I had gotten more accolades, I think that the second Louise book would have gotten more investment. I started to see it more from the business side. When I see it more from the business side, I can deal with it better than when I think about it as all of the, you know, you want to be um, friends with people and you want people to love you and you want people to love your book and you want people to, um, you want to, I don't know, you kind of want to feel like you're part of a team, which you are, but uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a business, and um, it helps me to think about it that way. I don't know if that makes any sense. It helps me to think about it more as a business than it does as like, oh. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's very fair to say, and I think that's an accurate assessment of what it is. It is, I, I you know... It is an industry that is full of people who are helpful and supportive and want to be 
with you for the long haul. And uh, and yet it's it isn't uh, it isn't vanity. It isn't. No one's doing anyone any favors. You know, their their decisions they need to make need to be need to have be net positives financially. Right. Right. Instead of being upset because someone else is getting something and you're not, I guess that's what I'm trying to, to pull out is like, it's very easy to look at the person next to you and go like, but that person is getting this, this, and this, why is it me? And, you know, um, look, they got stickers and I only got, a, you know, they, they put a standee on the counter for me, but that person has a whole display or, you know, an end cap or whatever. It's all this baloney. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's easy to... It's easy to get caught up in in the uh, personal part of it, and and that the only way I counteract that is that, that remember that like basically publishing is gambling, and they are gambling on every single book that they put out. They have no idea what's going to happen, and sometimes they they you know they put more chips on one person than the other, and that is that is absolutely true. Yep, mm-hmm. it is. It is, uh, that is objective truth. Uh, it is gambling, especially when you think of like the contracts. I, I, I when I explain contracts to my, to students, I explain it exactly that way. It's a gamble. They are fronting. They're giving you money that they expect to make. They're, they want to make that money. It isn't money that comes from a separate p- pocket. It comes from your pocket. Yeah. Here's yep. this money that you, we expect you to be making with this book. We're going to give it to you now so you can eat something and drink something while you work on your art for six months. And when the book goes on sale, we're expecting to get that advance back. And if yeah. we don't get the advance back, you don't get your royalties. Yep. And most books do not sell through. That was something, another thing that, another thing that I feel like more people need to be told in the up and coming is I understand most books, you'll get your advance, and you'll be really happy for it. And then you'll get that money when you finish, and you'll be really happy for it. And for, for the most part, that's all you're ever going to see. That's right. Because most books do not earn royalties. And, uh, you know, that's – there's a definite – I mean, I'm talking about the wider population, not people who are even SCBWI conference goers. The wider population thinks you got published. Oh, you must be rich now. They have no idea. They have no idea. The amount of time it makes to make a book, the amount of people it takes to make a book, and the amount of money that in actuality you get paid for a book, yeah. you know? So, um, yeah, and, and the fortunate thing is, again, because I am I am terminally honest, I get royalties on Louise. And Louise, uh, the first book, sold gangbusters. The second book, not so much. The readers are doing pretty good. Um, in the beginning, my royalty checks were quite large. And it's funny because it was so exciting to get that really big check. But just last week, I got a check for $695. And there's never been a check more exciting <laughs> than this $695 check because I am now at the point where I don't know if I'll keep getting, I don't know when the royalties will stop with Louise and I have three more Louise books to make and you know, God, I hope I get to make them. And if my math is right, that means it's uh, a, you're, you're, you have a seven book deal with them and yeah. Yes. And including mm-hmm. the readers. It isn't just all picture books. Yet. Yeah. It's three picture books, four readers was the deal. I like, I, and, it really, um, I, it makes me smile to think that you're doing readers because some of the illustrators that we've talked about today did all, also did readers. A lot of them did readers for Dr. Seuss, you know, Dr. Seuss's um, beginning books, oh, yeah. uh, uh, in print, you know, P.D. Eastman, Sid Hoff, they all did readers. I know. Seuss. Yes. Yeah. And I, I would love to do, I would love to do readers that are more akin to their readers. I hope it's possible. Um, yeah, I, I, I even asked at one point, like, can we have like an all white cover? <laughs> I was like, you know, like Sid Hoff had, and, but there's a, you know, now there's a, there's a formula for the, for the I can reads that, so that way they sit on the, on the shelf and they all look, you know, like they're in the sure. program. I'll but, tell you, um, I'll tell you a quick yeah. story about the all white cover. Uh, and then I, I want to change gears really quickly. Um, one quick story. So I, years and years ago, I was in a meeting and we were, there's a bunch of sales folks at a table. 
and it was a cover meeting in which the designers would present their covers to the sales force to say, hey, this book is about to go to the printer. Here's what the cover is going to look like. Just to get the salespeople to, you know, to see what it looks like and to sort of, you know, help them plan out what they're going to be doing. Same with marketing, other other departments. And and there was a cover that was fully white and a salesperson said, it can't be white. To which the designer Uh asked, why not? And the salesperson answered, Barnes & Noble doesn't like white covers. Yeah. They get dirty. Yeah. (laughs) That's what she said. And yeah. so they gave the cover a tint, a, a color tint, a very light color tint. And that solved yeah. the white, dirty cover problem. That's so crazy. So yeah. we're, we could talk forever, Kelly. We really could. Yeah. I wanted to sort of end with remembering who we're, who's in the room with us right here. And, and uh, okay. there are illustrators who are listening to this. Hopefully, all of my fingers and toes are crossed. There are people listening to this, and uh, they're hearing what you're saying, and they're thinking to themselves, like, okay, what is it that I should be doing? What is it that I should be focusing on? Social media is a bit of a disaster. It can be helpful, but it, it uh, when I go to social media, I'm speaking of this person. When I go to social media, I see illustrators who are far better than I am, quote, unquote, better than I am. When I check all the boxes, when I go to the conferences and I send the postcards and I do the email blasts and I curate my website, and I do what people say I should be doing. I'm not getting anything in return. So you had a little bit of that experience. I mean, you were, you were sending your portfolio out. You were getting rejections. You had uh, jerk art directors telling you that to, to take a hike, okay. which by the way, <laughs> uh, Norman, Norman Bridwell had the same experience. And I remember reading about this where uh, Clifford, the Clifford creator, he would show, he showed his portfolio around and an editor said to him essentially the same thing, essentially what I said to you. The editor said, y- you'll never make it in this business. And she did point to an illustration of his that had a girl and a big dog. And she said, you know, uh, she just didn't like his art. And she said, you know, if you write a story about this piece of art, maybe a publisher will allow you to illustrate it mm-hmm. a few days later he wrote Clifford he sent it around it got rejected by a bunch of publishers and either the eighth or the ninth publisher picked it up and Clifford obviously is Clifford uh, right. so I I don't know maybe it's an infamous connection but uh, I don't know Te- a tenuous connection <laughs> is more like it I think I think it's very helpful to have somebody to prove wrong I really do I think I think everybody needs motivation and motivation leads to momentum and momentum leads to something happening and what, you know, your motivation could be something different, but, but that is definitely something that motivates me and it motivates me in my personal life and my personal trials. It motivates me, um, in art and motivated me, it motivates me through the industry. I, don't like being told no <laughs> and I don't like being told I can't and I and I think my mother would totally say this it's been since day one I don't like that like don't tell me I can't don't tell me that I won't don't tell me that it's not going to happen if I can't go around you under you or above you I will go right through you <laughs> that's like what I will do so um I have Tenacity, and these are the, I'm saying this to the person in the room. You need to have these things. Tenacity and perseverance are more important than your talent. And that's not to say that I think that skills and technical uh, ability is unimportant. I, I value those things greatly. But tenacity and perseverance are the most important things that you can have. You cannot have those without backing them up with a good product that that you have. And you have to always rework and rework and rework that product because if you're showing the same thing over and over and over again and you're not getting reaction, well, then the problem is you. If you, if you, you know, you have to keep your eyes open and your ears open and your heart open and you have to listen. Whether someone tells you you have no business, right, being in it 
Or if people tell you, you know, oh, your portfolio is filled with Vikings and Vikings were so last year. You know, you have to be able to bob and weave and move with the flow. But the thing that can be unmovable is the fact that if you really want this, you're going to keep going after it. I think Chuck Jones would add to what you just said. And this is a direct quote from him by saying, we should take our work, but not ourselves seriously. I think so. Um, And he said, don't take life too seriously. You're not getting out of it alive. (laughs) (laughs) That's another thing he said. Yeah, I, I think, I think it's true. I think, I think that you have to have fun, right? Let's add to that. I mean, that's kind of what he said. Like, you know, you have to be able to, to, to find, find the reason why you're doing it. Like my thing is, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I doing this to myself? Because ultimately I've always been that kid who draws. I can't not draw. It needs to have a place to go. Plus it needs, I need to make money with the fact that I love to draw. So you have to like, you have to think about it that way. Like why, why am I doing this to myself? Check in with yourself as you're going. If you feel like you're beating your head against, you know, all of these closed doors, well then, you know, find the window, find the back way, go up the fire escape. There's a million different ways to crack this egg and you can find the way to crack it that is not necessarily the way everybody's telling you that you have to crack it. For me, I like to get myself in front of people along with my work because I knew that if they met me as they were looking at my work, they'd like my work more. And I, 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 I try very hard to not have an ego. Um, I don't, I run into a lot of egos in this business and I try very hard to not have an ego, but you have to have a little bit of one. You have to have enough ego to believe in yourself. And that was my, my way of going about this. It was like, if you can, sit down with that portfolio and me, or if you could see my portfolio in that room and then 10 minutes later, you're going to talk to me. You're going to be like, Oh wow. I totally get the connection. She is like her work. Her work is like her and she'd be good to work with. Yeah, And I, it, oh yeah. And I think the sort of, um, you can't going back to social media and going back to a lot of things that we've been saying, you, you can't wait for external, external sources to validate you. You have to start within yourself. You have to say, I will get out of bed today. I am going to put my feet on the ground and I'm going to make good choices. I'm going to do something for me. I'm going to draw for me. I'll create art for me. I'll write for me. And it will be something that comes from within. And it isn't some, you're not trying to, you're not doing any of that to tap into some quote unquote market that is a, a completely unknowable thing. And, and this is something that no one ever really talks about, but I'm going to. There are a lot of, there's a lot of guesswork in the publishing industry. There's a lot of like, we had no idea if this is going to work or not. It isn't, it isn't a science. It, it really is not a science. It, it's sort of a incredibly large dartboard. And uh, sometimes you hit it and sometimes you don't. And it's not easy. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people are going with their gut. You know, there's a lot of editors and a lot of art directors that have a gut reaction to something, and then they have to fight for that thing that they decide, like, oh, you know, I saw this, I like this person, sure, you know, and they have to then convince other people to make the money gamble on on the people. But yeah, it is. It's like it is like uh, throwing spaghetti at a wall. <laughs> well, uh, again, we could talk forever. We could, <laughs> but I just wanted to end uh, this conversation. This is our first podcast, Kelly. Okay. I don't know where this is going to go. I really don't. But I do know that if, if it stops here, I would have, I it would have been worth it. And I'm, I'm happy that you and I know each other the way we do. And keep doing, keep being yourself. I know you will. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, keep on keeping on <laughs> and, uh, one day and, at a time one foot in front of the other well, all of those those things are yeah, applicable 
And we do. We keep on keeping on. Thanks for being on the podcast, Kel. Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, by the way, you have all the business in the world to be in children's books. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Damn straight. (laughs) To learn more about Kelly Light, visit kellylight.com. If you enjoyed our conversation, please share it online, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us a positive rating and review. This helps us find new listeners, and on a personal note, it would be nice to know that the podcast is helping. Continue the conversation in the comments section of each episode at illustrationdepartment.com forward slash podcast. This podcast is produced by the Illustration Department, a global leader in online education for illustrators. Visit us at illustrationdept.com for class offerings, testimonials, the alumni showcase, and more. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.